Thanks for checking out this Game of Thrones review video. This is for Season 8, Episode 4, so we are almost there. This is the third to last episode, and things are ramping up because I'm going to tell you my star rating up front on this episode. This is the highest one of the of the season for me. This is a four and a half star. Um, so yeah, we're, we're almost there. We're almost to perfection as far as, you know, compared to Game of Thrones goes. You know, we're almost to Game of Thrones perfection on this one. So, great episode first off. Um, some really good stuff. We're actually picking up story because with the last one, there was a little bit of story in the last one, but it was mainly more about the battle, which is fine when it's like big and grandiose, and that one was fun. But as we all know, it was a little dark. It was a little hard to see things, so that kind of sucked. It's where they're like kind of cutting corners in a sense. But, all right, so here are my thoughts on this one. Um... Did you ever think, going into Game of Thrones and seeing past seasons, that we were going to get to a point where Sansa Stark would legitimately mourn the death of Theon Greyjoy? For a long time, probably were just like, nope. Kind of like me. But that's the great thing about Game of Thrones, is it brings it back at some point to, you know, back to the beginning. Back to where things started, in a sense. But it also takes things to a point where... People evolve so much. They go they go through much and become totally different people. Sometimes they, they go through so much that it takes them all the way around again. And, you know, we've kind of seen that. So that happened with Sansa. You know, she goes all the way back around and she's good with Theon in his passing. Like I said in the last episode, he had a very good death. Um, Jon Snow, when he was speaking at the body burning ceremony where they were, you know, burning all the dead from the last episode's battle, he... Um, he sounded very kingly, and his speech was very kingly. It, it, it was the words he was using, but it was very much the way he was saying things. His tone, how he was projecting, all that stuff. And they kind of set it up to be like, hmm, this is a moment where you can see him as a king, right? Just look at him like this. You can see him as a king. And you kind of see that on Daenerys' face as she's watching him, and she's just like, ooh, yeah, knowing who he actually is now and that he has a better claim to the throne than me, this is concerning, especially when he sounds like that, when he's talking to all these people and everyone's in on it. They love him. So, kind of kind of rough. The other thing is, I, you know, maybe I missed it and people can let me know down in the uh, comments down there, but I didn't see any Dothraki, by the way. When, when all the body burning was going on, I didn't see any Dothraki, so I was just like, did they all die? Because like I said in the last episode, I was like, they're just sending them all in there first to get killed. And that's kind of what it seemed like. So I assume they all didn't, that none of them make it. But then later on, I think Varys, when they're like doing battle planning, I think Varys kind of alluded to some Dothraki still being alive. So I was just like, oh, thank goodness. They didn't kill an entire like race of people, which is what I thought happened in the last episode. Um, so you kind of see that... Uh, the Daenerys, like, she changes kind of quick. Like, she goes from mourning Jorah, and then once he's gone, she's, like, back in go mode, and she's thinking about getting to that throne. And it seems very inappropriate for her to, to shift that fast because, you know, they're all having a good time. They're eating, they're drinking, they're celebrating. Celebrating the fact that they're still alive, but also celebrating the lives of the people they lost and kind of mourning them at the same time. And uh, it just seems like when she... She starts getting, like, very serious, and she's just like, oh, you know, I'm over this. It's kind of her attitude of how she's acting. She's, like, back to business, and you, you see her starting to get very insecure, and she's kind of like, ooh, I need to gr grab the reins of this back and start moving things forward. And it's just this kind of shift in her where you're kind of – I believe you're kind of more than – in past uh, episodes and past seasons, you're like, mm, maybe we should be questioning her a little bit. And that comes into play even more later in the episode, but I'll kind of talk about that as I go along. Um, and I, when she made Gendry a lord and was just like, oh, you should um, you should be a lord and you should get, uh, damn, I forget the, the island now. Um, excuse me for that but i forget the island she's like you should be a lord there you go i i think it was kind of a message of she's gonna try to get all these people with claims to the throne strong and weak into other positions where they kind of become loyal to her but also are kind of like out of the way like you go be on that island and do your thing and we'll be cool but we'll be cool from afar so it kind of gave me the idea that she was doing that in front of Jon Snow to kind of give the message like I kind of want people with legitimate claims to the throne 
uh, pacified or like away from me, you know? So that's kind of what it seemed like is it was like a signaling, uh, of that type of thing. But it was also to, you know, endear people with, with power in that sense to her, because if, you know, Gendry has a legitimate claim, if he were to one day say, oh, you know, I'm a Baratheon, I kind of am rethinking this thing. Maybe I want to be a king. Um, it's good for her to have the friendship there. She'd be like, I remember when I made you a lord and you were a bastard. So, uh. so anyway, um, uh, the real quick, the Tyrion and Davos bromance is exactly what I needed. I've always liked those two characters and to see them together, like talking in the last episode, I think the last two episodes and then this one, um, they were kind of like getting chummy and, and chatting a lot. And I just really like to see their interactions because I really like those actors. I really like those roles. And uh, yeah, it was just really cool. Um, <laughs> the other thing that hit me during this kind of like party scene, I was like, um, do we do, are we all like getting hammered and having sex now? Is, is that what we're doing? Because I'm pretty sure there was just a massive fight. Everyone should be very tired. Um, you're pulling your swords out again, so to speak. I I don't, you know. But, I mean, I guess at the same time, they're like, eh, uh, there's a lot less people here. We need to start repopulating. Let's go. Also, just the idea of when you're that close to death, it makes you, I guess, want to create life in a sense. But, no, I think more like live it up you know and what's one of the better ways to live it up especially when you don't have any sort of like real entertainment back then yeah, having sex is the best entertainment they had pretty much i mean you know saying this is like medieval times basically if you get that i'm sure you do um the moment when Gendry goes off when uh yeah Gendry goes to aria and he's just like oh i, I became a lord now i'd love you to come and be my lady and I got the exact quote. She said, I'm not a lady. I never have been. It was this great moment of like, boom, love it. Nice. Because one of the big things that drives me nuts with movies and TV shows is this whole thing where it's like, you always have to have a relationship. You always have to be in a relationship. You always have to be looking for it. But there are some people that that's not their, that's not, I was going to say not their destiny. In the context of this this show yeah there are some people where that's not their destiny but also just like in real life like not everyone's looking for a relationship let's get some of this relationship stuff out of the the series and the movies and everything like that because there are a lot of times where it doesn't even serve a story purpose and sometimes where it does ser serve a story purpose but it's so sh like forced that you're just like Ugh. One thing that really comes to, to really uh, the forefront of my mind is, like, the Avengers uh, Age of Ultron movie that Marvel did. Like, the relationship that they totally forced between uh, Black Widow and the Hulk slash Bruce Banner. It was just, like, it was out of nowhere. It didn't fit. It was really dumb. I know a lot of people complained about it. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the light went a little crazy. I had to just get it back under control. Um, so that stuff just bothered me. So when she was just like, I... I don't want any part of this, basically. I was like, awesome, cool. Because that's how people like her character anyway, is just like a straight-up badass who's like, I'm going my own way, I'm going to do my own thing. And that's what she's doing here. And then she goes and strikes out on the road with Sandor Clegane, the Hound. And that was another moment, kind of like the Tyrion and Davos moment, where I was just like, yeah, I needed this. I'm, I'm excited to see this. They're going to go out adventuring together, basically. They're hitting the road together. They're together like they were before, but this time they're kind of his equals, to be honest. Actually, not even his equals. Arya's a little bit uh, above him because he basically got torn down throughout the, the series and is more, way more humbled, although he's still a skilled fighter, and Arya came from nothing, and now she's this, this person known as the one who saved westeros basically and destroyed the night king so it's like whoa so like she's up here now and he's down here and i i don't know i just love where like i love where that potentially could go and i know we don't have a whole lot of episodes to explore it but if they had like a spin-off i know they're doing spin-offs of the show but a spin-off i personally would like to see is the sandor clegane and Arya stark adventuring buddy show that's what i want That'd be awesome. And then Tyrion and Davos. But then again, we don't know if any of these people will even survive the show. So we'll find out. Um, 
so when everyone was trying to get it on, I just kind of wrote down, is this the boudoir episode where, like, we just keep going into bedrooms and everyone's trying to get into the bedrooms? Which reminds me that, like, the the romance scene between Jamie and Brienne, I was kind of like, it makes sense to me. Like, I'm cool with that because he really needs to be with someone else in order to get over Cersei. Like, he's never had any love other than his twin sister. Gross. Uh, but uh, we've, you know, well-tread material at this point. But um, he needs to have that connection with someone else you know, emotionally and sexually in order to move on, basically. And I kind of was seeing it as, man, this is the moment where he could totally cross over and become that different person because he gets over Cersei and he sleeps with Brienne. It's a weird kind of start to a sex scene, but it makes sense because, uh, you know, they're both knights. Uh, she's never had sex before. He's having sex finally not with his sister. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it, it is awkward, like appropriately so. But then when he wakes up, he you see him kind of with this emotion on his face of like, is this a mistake? And I think what it really is, is that he's uncomfortable being a better person. He's uncomfortable not being tied to Cersei, not being a bad person. You know, he's made this transformation kind of of being much better when he went to Winterfell and he's going to fight for what's good and he left Cersei. But in the end, after he cleared his mind, so to speak, and had sex with Brienne and tried being good and having a different relationship, he just kind of got scared. He got cold feet and was like, it doesn't feel comfortable for me to be good. Like, he's afraid of being something good. He's afraid of being someone who can really contribute to the betterment of the realm, basically, of the kingdom. So he has that moment where like Brienne is pleading with him and she's just like, don't go, which is a really good moment. Very well written, very well acted. The dialogue's really nice and it's very emotional and you can see, you know, like he's welling up. So you can tell by the way he reacts to Brienne that what he wants, what he like really, really wants at the heart of himself is to be with her and to be a good person. Like she said that she believes he is, but he just feels like, he doesn't deserve it in a sense. Like he feels like he doesn't deserve it because he's he's come to terms with all the terrible things he's done and he finally kind of has a conscience. But then there's also, like I was talking about, that familiarity with I don't feel comfortable not being a bad person and not being tied to Cersei. So he leaves. And so it'll be interesting to see how things go. But in the end, what he really needs to do is kill Cersei so he's totally cut loose. We'll see if that even happens. Fingers crossed. I know everyone else, else out there is like, yeah, please. Um, so, oh, okay. So the the other bedroom scene that I want to talk about was with uh, Daenerys and Jon Snow. Well, Aegon Targaryen. Uh, where Daenerys seems to, because she was looking at him after she got the news about him being Aegon. Um, she looks at him differently. You know, she's kind of like, oh, that's my brother. And also like, uh, he's possibly competition eh. but when she goes into the bedroom it's like she's reverting back to what they had before she knew and she even says something like i wish i didn't know but you can you can sense you can sense that all of this is coming from her planning part of her brain this isn't so much emotional as it is look i need to get him to stay subservient to me in a sense i need that to happen because she's so focused on the throne that that I mean that's where her head is so she's not thinking about a relationship with him she's not really like oh I do love him I think she's kind of gotten off that at this point because it feels too uncomfortable from the incest standpoint and from the competition for the throne standpoint so she's just trying to make smart moves and I think that was also signal with what started at the celebration in the like beer hall is the best way I can put it so that's how I saw that is that's a move like she's not I don't think she's really interested anymore and you know he was amicable he was just like hey you know I I don't want to be king I, I'm down with this so um oh and they finally brought up Dorne finally we haven't seen anything with Dorne in quite some time so hopefully I think they're still alive at least some of them the sand snakes hopefully the sand snakes show up in some episodes coming up well 
the last two episodes, basically, because Dorne's just not been in it. And it'll be interesting to see if Highgarden gets involved in any capacity as well, because once you're not, like, focusing on these other areas of Westeros, uh, you kind of forget they're there. And then when they're when something comes up, like, they, they mentioned Dorne, and I was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, let's let's get them involved. Let's do this. So we'll see. But it's nice to kind of, you know, be reminded uh oh and at the moment where they're kind of planning things out like with the map and everything and Daenerys started you know saying some kind of suspicious type things and Arya's kind of looking at her like mm, I thought to myself I think Arya's kind of mentally saying I might have to kill this person it is a possibility I might have to kill this person so I don't know if you all felt that way or not but yeah um also I forgot how much I missed Bronn when Bronn showed up and he was threatening uh, Jaime and Tyrion, that was an awesome scene. Like, his dialogue is always great. His character is played to perfection for what the character is. And he's always, like, like a menacing, like, crappy but funny guy. And uh, I don't know. He's just really enjoyable. So it was really nice to have that scene with him and the play between he and Tyrion. Like, they've they always had a great relationship. So... That was really nice to see come back. Um, yeah, I already wrote about the Arya and, and the Hound together. Oh, uh, how about the the moment where Sam Samuel Tarly is like super excited to tell Jon Snow how he had sex? Not just that he had sex, but try to explain how that went down. <laughs> and Gilly's just basically like he it, he's had sex before. He knows. He knows how this goes. She's like, I've had sex before too, but you know, I understand this is a big deal for you, buddy. But no, it's this is just an, a further moment of Sam kind of being more adult, becoming less of, you know, like a child. Like, he was a child for a lot of the show, and this is him really growing up. I mean, he's the man of the, the Tarly house now, in a sense. So, no, I mean, he is, not in a sense. He is. So, uh, I thought that was good. Um, do, do, do. Oh, okay, this is an important quote right here. I think this is an important quote. Let me read this to you. When Vari says, quote, I'm not sure it matters what he wants. People are drawn to him. That quote is why Aegon Targaryen, Jon Snow, is the heir to the Iron Throne. That is why he should, and I believe will, be on the Iron Throne. Because of that quote. That quote signals what a ruler is, what a good ruler or a good president or a good leader or whatever is. Because obviously you can draw parallels between real life and fake life and all that type of stuff. But the thing is this, just think about this. I've always said there are two types of politicians. There are people who do it because it's for them and they want power and they're doing it for their own glory. And then there's the good type, basically, that are the people who don't want to do the job. They really, if they had the a, like a real choice and were able to, um, I guess, ignore their conscience, they would say, I pass on this, I want to have a normal life, I just don't want any part of it. They're the people who do the best job because they're not doing anything for them. They're driven by the want of the people, by the will of the people, and it's totally philanthropic. And that's how Jon Snow is. And that's not anymore how Daenerys is. And she started that way. But through everything she went through, you see these small changes starting to happen as she has to make the hard decisions. And she finally gets to this point, which I think is basically now where she's, we're, we're starting to realize she's, she's just, when she says she's doing stuff for the people of Westeros, she's just using it as a slogan now. She doesn't mean it. She doesn't. She's totally not even thinking about that anymore. She's thinking about her power and how she wants the throne. It's all about that drive now. She's been so focused on just getting there and doing what it takes that she's forgotten what she started out for, like what the reason was that she started out, and she doesn't feel that anymore. But Jon Snow would because he doesn't even want it, and that's why it's going to be him, in my opinion. Um... So then we cut, we get to the point where there's the sea battle, and as soon as that was going to happen, I was like, oh, sweet. We haven't really seen, like, a, a sea versus sea battle yet. I mean, we saw some, like, battle into the sea and from the sea and Battle of the Blackwater some seasons ago, but this one I was like, oh, man, like, ships on ships, let's get it on. So you see a little bit of that 
And then it's like, oh, psych, we're not doing that. And I was like, oh, what a cop out. And then it made me think, look, if you're going to cut out on this right now, and it was so dark for that giant fight in Winterfell, then the end of this series better be the most epic fight for King's Landing. It better be huge. It better be awesome. And I better be able to see it clearly. And it better be at least like one and a half episodes long, basically. That's all I'm saying. Which, but with the way that this one ended, it kind of seems like we're jumping into it in the next episode. Like, we're going to get it all in here. So... Uh, but the other thing I noted was when that dragon goes down, I mean, first of all, good on them because you don't really see it coming. It's just like, and then he gets it three times. But I will point this out. There is no way shooting from a ship in the sea, those gigantic arrows, is that ballast? or I think so. Um, there is no way that they hit that dragon with that. And even if they do, there's no way they hit him three times and in quick succession. That's some unrealistic BS. But then again, so are dragons. Just saying. But I was just kind of like, come on. Yeah, right, they wouldn't. But anyway. Um, yeah, I just wrote Battle for King's Lighting. Better be amazing. It better be amazing. I know everyone out there watching this is feeling me on that. Because the other thing is they took two years to get this season together. And thus far, I do not see anything that says it should have taken two years. I'm just saying. Just saying. Unless that, that last fight is crazy epic, which I'm expecting it. And if it is, then I'm like, fine, two years. Makes sense. Um, do you really think that Cersei would listen to anyone? Also, do you really think that Cersei would marry Euron? First of all, we know that she said, this is your baby, and it's not her baby because she told Jamie it was his baby, which I'm assuming was the truth. Um, but then again, who knows, but, um, she wouldn't marry Euron. She just, dis she's disgusted by that guy. She's just playing him. Even if things came out in the end in her favor and all of her enemies were gone, I think she would find a way to kill Euron. I really do. She finds him repulsive as do most of us or maybe all of us. I don't know. Uh, so when Masandi was taken and then she's killed, I could care less. I'm going to be honest, I'm sorry I'm coming off as like really crappy and callous right now, but that story moment, that story blip, because her 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 screen time is very low, and her relationship with Grey Worm did kind of come out of nowhere. That is that is one of those like uh, romances that I feel like is, is poorly developed. I mean, it's somewhat developed, it's better than what I was referencing in Age of Ultron, but it's, it's not that great developed, and it, it's more of like a distraction more than anything. And so when she was taken, I was like, fine, whatever, bye. And then when she got her head lopped off, I was just like, okay, let's, uh, we fighting now or, or what? Let's go. I think we are. We're fighting. Um, yeah, and then I was just writing that at this point you have to realize Daenerys has been turning bad. All this time. she's Slowly her character, her good character, has been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. She's not what she was. And her motivation is no longer philanthropic. It's just a slogan of, I want to do for people. I took so many notes, I have to flip the page. Um, but it, you get this moment of like, man, this kind of sucks. Sorry, lighting again. You get this moment of like, man, this kind of sucks when Varys and Tyrion are talking and they're like kind of like do we turn on her do we go for Jon Snow because obviously everyone knows now who he is because you can't tell anyone a secret especially not family because that stuff will be all over the place case in point so <laughs> so when those two are talking it's this kind of crappy moment where you're like Ugh, she did a lot of work and they might ditch her and everyone might just be like sorry we're going with this guy over here even though I mean, thanks for everything. <laughs> so, really, like, she did everything, and but the problem is she's tainted. She isn't the best choice anymore, which brings me to something I wrote down, which is just because you created something doesn't mean that you own it. And that's a perfect example of what's going on with Daenerys right now. She kind of created the best chance 
to get a better government in place, get a better ruler in place for Westeros. She started the movement. But it doesn't mean she owns it, because if you're doing it for the people, the people own it. And at that point, the people get to choose. It's like, it is like a democracy. You know, people get to vote. They get to choose. So in this situation, even though it's always been rulers, you know, a monarchy, these people, because Daenerys' movement was started by the people for the people, they get to choose. So she needs to get to a point where she realizes, even though she wants the power and wants the throne, she needs to realize that the movement she started, it's more than her. And it doesn't belong to her. It never did, really. It never did. She was just a figurehead to get it going in the right direction, to charge it through to King's Landing and then allow the true ruler to take over. Just saying. Um, oh, and the last thing I said, because it was at the end, did you really think that Cersei was going to listen to anything? To anything. Like, when Tyrion's trying to plead with her, like, he knows her better than anyone. You really think he was going to be able to... Uh, convince her of anything if they couldn't convince her to join the fight against the white walkers which could have wiped out everyone and everything do you really think you could talk her now into not fighting when she has to give up the throne in order to not fight no so that really didn't make sense to me because Tyrion knows better than that or maybe it was just a situation where he's like this is, these are the rules this is what you got to do you got to try and talk it out i'm supposed to be the diplomatic one so maybe it's a little bit that but the thing is this, everyone knows, and I'm sure, I hope that no one who was watching this thought that Cersei might even think about not going to war. Because she's an emotional brick wall. She's always been an emotional brick wall. And that's how it is. So where are we going from here? Obviously fighting. And like I said, it better be awesome. And like I said, I think Jon Snow ends up on the throne because he has to, because he is the good ruler. Although, George R. R. Martin, you know how he does things, and things don't always go the right way. So maybe we get the worst possible scenario, and Cersei wins, and everything sucks. That is possible. I don't know, but we'll find out. Or maybe the people from Dorne show up and they take it over. Or from Highgarden show up and they take it over. There's a lot in play. There's a lot that could be in play. Let me put it that way. But anyway, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I look forward to doing the videos for the last two. Real quick, shout out to Laura and Danny Sanborn. Those two individuals have been watching my videos together at night. This These videos are a wonderful um, couple's activity. I will say that. So enjoy, you guys. Thank you everyone for watching this, everyone who has, but please help me out. Hit the subscribe up there. Hit the notification bell on YouTube. Uh, that way you'll know whenever I'm putting out a new video, you can go check it out. And word of mouth is a good thing too. If you like it, tell people. Also, you have something to say about the episode or your thoughts or your predictions, put it in the comments below. And thank you very much. But until next time, keep it brutal.